Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. This channel is dedicated to finding out whether I really do know it all or not. Make sure if you like the video that you hit the thumbs up and you ask questions in the comments or at my email address. Either one is great. Uh, so today I decided I was going to start a series on uh, the practical uses of AI and how artificial intelligence actually works in the real world. Um, you know, and how it's making a difference to, to, to everybody's lives. So um, hopefully this will be useful, and I would love to continue the series. If you have specific questions, by all means, ask them, like a company or a specific technology you've heard of or something like that. I'm happy to um, work on all of those. Uh, anyway, today I want to talk about why Tesla's AI in their cars is better than the competition, really most everything else that's out there right now. And as I was doing research, I realized I was going to have to split this into two videos, so make sure that you definitely hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more of this. But basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do part one, which is going to talk about how does AI for cars work, which also tails into generally what is artificial intelligence nowadays? How does it work? Um, and then I'm going to have a part two of this video in which I'm going to talk about how Tesla specifically is working in a very interesting way to outperform the competition, essentially. So they're doing something different. So part one, we're going to talk about how does AI work in the context of driving a self-driving car, so a car that drives itself automatically. All right, so the first thing we should probably talk about is what are the benefits of having a self-driving car as opposed to a person driving a car? So generally speaking, a, um, a self-driving car is safer. Like, that's really, really true. A self-driving car is significantly safer than a human driving car. Um, because it's always attentive, it doesn't have emotions, right? It doesn't get mad if somebody cuts it off. Uh, it doesn't have fatigue, it doesn't get tired, it doesn't get distracted by the kids in the back seat screaming. Um, it can also see in all directions, right? It has cameras or something that's detecting 360 degrees around it. And uh, so as opposed to humans who only have two little eyeballs <laughs> that can do this. Uh, it can also eventually, uh, AI uh, self-driving cars can become cooperative. So if you think about if you had all self-driving cars on a highway and you came to a construction zone, right? That's a situation where human beings are quite competitive, right? Somebody's always trying to get in that lane right to the last second and cut in in front of other people. You end up with traffic jams, it's a nightmare. Whereas all of these cars could communicate with each other and they could cooperate to make sure that they all kind of slot in and everybody gets home as fast as possible as a group rather than each individual person trying to get home faster than everybody else. So that's a big advantage also. In addition, there's something I hadn't thought about before, but as I was researching this, the claim is made that eventually our car insurance will go down also, right? So if we're not driving the car, if the machine's driving the car and it's safer, and then the insurance companies will give us a break on that. So that would be nice. <laughs> It'd be nice to save some money on car insurance. I will wait for that day to happen. We will see. Uh, the, the big problem right now, honestly, is not so much the eventual getting to the place where cars are all autonomously driven the problem right now is that we have a, we're going to have to have a balance for years between human beings and self-driving cars and that's going to be a complicated situation so we'll see how that goes okay just to really quickly specify the safety issue uh, there have been exceptionally few fatalities I'm just going to talk about fatalities as opposed to accidents because the records are a little bit better but in general um, there are about of with human drivers there are about 16,400 car accidents per day and about 1.18 fatalities per million miles um, so that means one person dies for every million miles of driving that is done in the United States. This is specific to the U.S., but I'm sure it translates to most other countries pretty evenly. Uh, in addition, 94% of car accidents are chalked up to human error, so that's a massive, massive amount that's human error. Uh, for self-driving cars, the best statistics I could find is that there was one fatality at level three, which I'll talk about in just a minute, and there were 15 fatalities at level two since 2016. The best I could find on how many million miles, and this is very out of date because I think this was the end of 2018, but it said there are 0 0.3 fatalities per 1 million miles of driving. The not amount of miles that have been driven has gone way up since then, so I'm sure that's a much lower number. So I would, I would say at least 10 times more safe, maybe closer to 100 times safer than a human being driving a car. I have a feeling that in 
say, 10 years, 15 years, people are going to look at human beings driving cars and say, why would you do that? That's insanity, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's kind of like they'll think they're like daredevils or something, right? People who go and jump over things on motorcycles will say, why would you ever do this? It's so unsafe. Okay, so let's talk about the basics of self-driving first. There are what's considered to be five levels of autonomy. Well, there's actually six. There's a level zero, which is no autonomy. So, okay, we'll just skip that. Level one is cruise control. Most people have cruise control in their cars. That's just the basic thing where you push the button. If if you don't turn off cruise control in time, you will run into somebody or go through a traffic light or something, right? So that's that's very basic autonomy. Level two is advanced cruise control, and a lot of newer cars, say 2018, 2019, 2020 model cars, have this. It's adaptive cruise control, for example. Like if you get too close behind another car, your car will slow down. It will come to a complete stop. It might auto brake if somebody pulls out in front of you and you're driving down a road. So there's a lot of those little features in there that um, help to make the car safer. So that's level two. Level three is general autonomy. And what that means is the car can pretty much drive itself, but either due to the, the fact that the machines aren't working quite well enough or due to regulatory reasons, you still have to keep your hand on the steering wheel to make it work. When you get to level four, which is what you know, Tesla every year, they're like, by the end of this year, we're going to get there. So <laughs> we'll see if it happens in 2020, I hope. Uh, but that's full autonomy. That means that you can take your hands off the wheel. You can say, drive to the grocery store. It will pull out of your driveway. It will drive to the grocery store. It'll park in the parking lot. You get out of the car. You know, that's the level of autonomy we're talking about. And then level five is actually the same thing, except this would be something like a robo taxi where there's not even any steering or braking or accelerating stuff in the car. <laughs> like literally you just get in and the car is like a, a, like a train or something, right? It's like a car of a train. There's no driving equipment available to you at all. So that's level five. Uh, level two, obviously, as I was saying, is fairly common right now. Level three is getting here level four, you know, the problem is right now, I think the technology is really, really close to being ready. So it's going to depend a massive amount on the regulatory framework. Each country, each state, each community may have different things. So some people may get it very, very soon. And it may take uh, other countries and other states a much longer time to get this in. But I think the technology is really, really close to getting there. So I think we're in good shape on that. So we're getting close to having fully autonomous cars. Okay, so let's talk about the three main pieces of a self-driving car. The first piece is sensors. So you have to have something that senses the environment. With a human being, that would be our eyeballs and actually to some extent our inner ears, right? When you turn, you feel the fact that the car is moving and so forth. Um, most self-driving cars have some combination of these three things. They have vision, which is cameras. They have LIDAR, which is laser radar. And they have traditional radar. Uh, level two autonomy, which which is like the adaptive cruise control uses radar. So like I have a Mazda CX-5 and it has like a little thing in the front with the M symbol, but you can tell it's clear and there's a radar that shoots through it and it bounces signals off what's in front of it. And if it gets too close or if that thing's moving too slowly, it breaks. It also has a couple of them out the back so that if you're backing up or something and some like a person walks across the back, it will beep at you. So that's that's radar. And so all of these things are used in combination or by themselves, etc., etc. So we'll talk about that more when we get to part two, because that is a major difference between Tesla and other companies. All right, the next part is the, the actual thing that runs this, the software. Almost exclusively today, that is neural networks. It used to be handcrafted crazy stuff in the 1990s until the, the early 2000s. And, you know, people would construct individual things like this is a face, this is another car, this is a piece of a sidewalk, et cetera, et cetera. It was incredibly laborious. It was very difficult. Neural networks are much more like a human brain. They're kind of general purpose networks. And what you do is you train them to be specifically good at one task. And in this case, though, I mean, <laughs> one task, what I mean by that is driving. So there might actually be hundreds of little neural networks running at the same time. Like this one detects a stop sign and this one might detect people and this one might detect other cars and this one might detect the stripe down the side of the, the middle of the road. And this one might detect the curb or the sidewalk or something, right? So there's all of these networks that are running simultaneously together and giving information to the car. And then there's probably one master neural network that is has to decide how to, you know, what to do in the next fraction of a second. Does it break? Does it turn right? Does it keep going straight? Et cetera, et cetera. 
So in general, neural networks learn by trial and error. And what that means is, of course, at first you don't want something that's completely untrained. That'd be like taking a toddler and letting him drive the car. Uh, you put them in a virtual world, and they can drive millions and millions of miles very, very rapidly, crash into things, you know, get a lot of information and learn very rapidly what they need to do. And then they will eventually get put on the real roads, etc. One of the very clever things that's being done now is that a lot of these um, neural networks are learning sort of by demonstration. So as human beings drive, they're collecting this data and they're learning how a human would deal with a situation like this. Like what happens if the mail truck parks by somebody's mailbox and you have to get around them, right? For a human being, we're like, okay, we got that. But that could cause a neural network to completely freak out if it doesn't have any evidence of this. So it might look to human beings to go like, what do I do? How do I get around the mail truck when I have to do this? So that's the kind of thing where where these computers have to learn over and over and over again. And we're going to talk about data in just a minute, but that's like the crucial, crucial element of this. Okay, so this kind of touches on learning, right? So what is learning? How do these networks learn? This is kind of a generally important thing. This is actually kind of the critical element of modern artificial intelligence is how do they learn? And there's kind of three types of learning in general categories. There's supervised learning, su semi-supervised learning, and unsupervised learning. So let's kind of break it down. Supervised learning is generally used with labeled data, which means something like you have a picture, you say, this picture has a dog in it, this picture has a cat in it, right? And then you give it a million of these pictures with dogs and cats, you let the AI network train on that, and eventually the network gets to the point where it's like, ah, this is a dog, this is a cat. How it does it, a little bit of a mystery, honestly, these days. But there is, there is some information about that, and I can talk more specifically about it if anyone's interested. But that's the kind of thing that you can do, and that's a kind of, I guess, traditional now uh, neural network task. The, the bugaboo with this is that you not only have to collect a million pictures of dogs and cats, but some poor slob has to go and label every single one of these, which is really, really time consuming, right? I've done it myself. It sucks. Uh, and even worse than that, what if you have a picture with a dog and a cat in it? Well, what do you do then? Which, which label is it? So sometimes labels aren't even correct. And that's just a really simple example. There are many examples that are more complicated that cause problems like that. Okay. So then we get to semi-supervised learning, which is that we give it the uh, network some indication of what's right and wrong, but not all the data is labeled, or we're just giving it some heuristic or rule of thumb indication of where it should be looking, and we kind of tell it what's going on. You could think of this like in the first case, we have a teacher that's very strict, and it's like holding up a sign, and you say, that's a dog, and it goes, no, this is a cat, right? In this situation, you've got a teacher who is sometimes giving you corrections, so it's kind of like pushing you in the right direction, but it's letting you kind of fool around and figure out what's going on by yourself for the most part, and it's just pushing you a little bit in the right way once in a while. Uh, so that would be semi-supervised. Unsupervised, as you might imagine, is not supervised. So here you have a whole bunch of data, and that's super efficient for human beings, right? Because you can collect data. It's a lot easier to collect a million pictures by scraping the web than it is to label a million pictures or video data or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or millions of miles of driving, for example, ha <laughs> with cars. Uh, the problem with this is how do you learn when you don't even know what you're learning, right? The, the, the machine then has to almost learn what it's learning. Traditionally, unsupervised learning was only really good at doing things like clustering. So it might say like, this group of things is different from this group of things. I don't know what either one of them is, but they're different from each other. And But nowadays, people have gotten a lot more clever with the algorithms, and they're able to kind of learn and bootstrap these ideas. And so it might start with just clustering, but eventually it's able to kind of label these things. The, the kind of important thing that AI is trying to do with driving and with a lot of other things too, is to take pixels from an image just to take a general sense of the world world or like dots from lidar or whatever and actually turn that into a conceptual object so what that means is like if you think about yourself you you're driving and you see a, a red sign that's an octagon with some white on it etc your brain then goes it does whatever magic it does and it goes stop sign 
right? And once you identify that as stop sign, then you can take action. You can go like, oh, that's a couple hundred yards away or a couple hundred meters away, and I need to slow down because I got to stop there, right? So that's the kind of thing you can do once you've conceptualized the idea of it. The really, really, really hard part is conceptualizing the idea. What is that thing, right? And and what if it's a stop sign at night and so it looks kind of black? Or what if it's a stop sign without any lights on it whatsoever? Or what if it's a stop sign with a tree growing halfway over it? These are all incredibly complicated situations for computers to learn about. But that's the kind of thing that they have to do as they're as they're working on trying to learn this. Which brings us to the two last pieces of the puzzle here, which is hardware and data. So software running on general purpose CPUs or GPUs is great, but for a car, you need something incredibly specific. And so Tesla, for example, has manufactured their own uh, computing processing unit, and they actually have two of them that are uh, completely redundant, completely identical, and they vote. And if both of them don't come up with the same answer, it tosses that out and it goes on to the next thing. So we'll talk about that more in part two. But it's really, really important to have a very, very fast processor that's able to deal with this. And part two, of course, is data is king. You have to have so much data to train these. One of the cool things about neural networks is they are very general purpose. You can almost train them to do anything. The caveat to that is that you have to have so much data to do it. So millions of miles, billions of miles, trillions of data points, you know, all of that kind of stuff is critical for this. And again, if you think about it, how could you possibly label all that? So it's also really, really critical that uh, an efficient learning algorithm is going to be able to do it mostly on its own. So that's the kind of you know, super important thing. The holy grail of learning is if you think about it, you want to be able to have access to almost infinite amounts of really good quality data and not have to do anything to it. That the learning algorithm can take that raw data and it can learn from it. The more you have to interact with that data and process it or label it or do other things to it, the worse it gets because that just means human beings have to be involved and we, I hate to say, are very, very slow compared to computers. So that was part one of this. That kind of gives you a general overview of how AI is used for self-driving cars. In part two, we're going to talk about Tesla versus Google and Waymo and other companies and what they're doing differently from each other and how one has an advantage over the other one or not. Uh, Maybe they're similar, maybe they don't have it. I personally believe that Tesla has a very, very large advantage and I will talk about that in part two. So anyway, I hope you enjoy this. If you do, please make sure you like and subscribe and make sure you ask questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. I would be super happy to answer questions concerning how AI is used in you know, not just cars, but other industries like spaceships or uh, robotics for manufacturing things or, uh, I don't know, on the International Space Station. <laughs> I don't know if it's being used on the International Space Station, but I'm just saying, like, you know, wherever you think it might be interesting to look at, and even if you have questions about what AI is in particular or a specific question about a word you've heard or a term you've heard, I'm happy to answer that. So by all means, ask away. Till next time, bye-bye. <laughs>